Hello and welcome to this critical thinking live debate by Friends of Europe. I'm Negar Mortaza V here in Washington, DC. I'm a journalist and political analyst and host of the Iran podcast. This event is part of the Iran in Focus series in which we will discuss the significance of Iran's upcoming elections and its impact on the country's domestic and foreign policies. As of now, the balance of power in the election seems to be shifting towards, towards the hardliners and conservatives, a result of this which um, would impact Iran's diplomatic efforts and engagements with the West. Um, however, electoral developments in Iran are constantly shifting and things can even change in the final days and moments. So we're watching this election very carefully um, the election is set to happen on Friday, and um, we will be discussing its impact on the country's domestic policies, civil society, as well as the country's foreign policy towards the West, its regional policy, and other issues. I'm joined by two excellent experts on this topic. Azadeh Zamiri Rod is a deputy head of the Africa and Middle East Division at the German Institute for International and Security Affairs. Joining me from Berlin, uh, she provides policy advice to the German government, the Bundestag, and other decision makers in Europe. I'm also joined by Ruzbe Parsi, who is head of the Middle East and North Africa program at the Swedish Institute of International Affairs. And he's also the director of the European Iran Research Group. Welcome to you both, and thanks for joining me. Thank you. Thank you, Nico. Good to be here. It's great to have you. Um, so as we see the balance of power or sort of the, the path forward is set um, for a smooth victory for the top hardline candidate, which is the current head of judiciary, Ibrahim Raisi. And he's basically believed at least by a considerable uh, number of Iranians to be the shoe in candidate for this election, the even the setup of the live debates, the other candidates, uh, it all seems to indicate that the hardliners wanted to clear a path for a victory for him. We've also witnessed an unprecedented mass disqualification of other candidates by the Guardian Council. Um, Iranian elections have never been fair or free, but they've always been competitive, at least among the political factions in the system. But this time around, um, the setup has been very different. Azad, I want to start by you asking you um, about the significance of this election, this mass disqualification, the voter apathy that we've witnessed among Iranians, this lack of hope in the electoral process. A lot of criticism are coming at it. And um, what you think this setup uh, is and means for Iran's future? Sure. I mean, let me start by saying that um, obviously mass disqualifications and pre-selection of candidates is nothing new. We've, we've had that in, in almost all electoral cycles. What is different this time around, though, is that while in the past we didn't really see full representation of the population in the candidates, we usually saw factional representation, at least to a certain degree. And this time around, we see a striking imbalance when it comes to factional uh, representation, both in quality and in terms of quantity. We have around five candidates from the conservative and principalist camp, and only one candidate from the reformist current and one independent candidate. And the candidate from the reformist current isn't a leading figure in the reformist camp, while at the same time in the principalist conservative camp, one of the main potential competitors namely Ali Radi Jani, the former uh, speaker of Iranian parliament was disqualified, um, essentially leaving Raisi, the front runner now in the conservative camp um, without a really strong heavyweight that could counter his chances. So as you said, Negard, he's obviously in the best possible position to win this election, even though as you also mentioned, um, I think Iranian electoral processes are always very dynamic, um, oftentimes surprising in their outcome, and a lot can still happen um, in these finishing lines. But still, the way that this thing was set up, the composition of the candidates is 
quite limited, even by the standards of the Islamic Republic itself. And that's quite striking and something that has been noted by many within the conservative camp themselves. who are not happy about how this whole thing came about. Now, the reason for all of this is obviously no mystery. We have already entered the very critical transitory stage of uh, managing succession. And managing succession is actually a core challenge, if not an existential one, for all autocratic systems. And the Islamic Republic managed to have a successful succession once in the past, and they want to secure a second successful succession um, without destabilizing the country. So all the political factions at, at this point are trying to be in the best possible position to have a really big say on the outcome of the succession question. And for Raisi, this could mean he himself potentially becoming the next Supreme Leader. So all in all, these elections are much bigger than just a presidency of, let's say, four to eight years. This is about the highest, most influential post in the political order of the Islamic Republic and potentially um, shaping the destiny of this Republic for decades to come. Indeed. So the next president will most likely, as we've seen with experience with the Islamic Republic, usually presidents run for two terms. Once they win, they usually win the second election. So that will be an eight year term for whoever becomes president, if that is the Ibrahim Raisi. And then potentially, if it becomes the next supreme leader for another two, three decades within the Islamic Republic. Ruzba, I want to ask you the same question. First of all, if you see Ibrahim Raisi as the shoo-in candidate, if you believe that he has a chance at the presidency and then potentially ambitions for, uh, for becoming the next leader of the country, I also want you to comment on the Iranian population, this voter apathy that we're uh, witnessing that seems to be unprecedented. It's expected that the participation in this election will most likely be even the lowest in the history of the Islamic Republic, at least for presidential elections. Talk about this dynamic and uh, what you think might happen maybe as a surprise, as a last minute surprise, as opposed to what the hardliners have been setting up for IEC. Well, thank you. I mean, I'm old enough to remember when everyone expected Nator Nouri to become president of Iran in 1997, and no one thought that Khatami could stand a chance because he was less well known, he was weaker, he did not have the ear of the supreme leader, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then Khatami went to win two elections with the highest turnout and, and, and biggest results ever, basically, in the Islamic Republic. So I think I agree with us that obviously they're trying to set this up and game the system the way they always do. Uh, maybe they will succeed this time. But at the same time, it's important to remember that there is some competition left. There's always the competitive element in this very intense election cycle, which is very, very short, the campaign, uh, which can change things. And that has happened several times. Khatami wasn't the only surprise candidate to win. No one expected Ahmadinejad to become president. Everyone expected Qalibov to be the president, et cetera, et cetera. So I think there is that element. But what makes that possible is, of course, that the population cares enough to go and vote and basically rebalance whatever the system has gained to its own advantage. So now the question is, will enough people go out and vote, A, and B, will they find if you will, a channel, a canvas, an empty canvas on which they can project all their own aspirations and hopes and fears and make that candidate the counterbalance to Raisi. Uh, and the person who now seems to be that candidate is Hemati, whether he has enough of it in his own self, so to speak, to be able to, to rise to that occasion remains to be seen. But that is often what happens, is that you don't necessarily vote for someone you want to see in the presidential palace. It's making sure that the person you don't want to see there doesn't get elected. Now, the apathy aspect, there is another aspect to that compared to earlier elections, of course, and that is social media. I think we shouldn't forget that there is a very different landscape in which you can mobilize people today compared to, say, 10 or 15 years ago. That does not necessarily mean that all of those who are mobilized are going to vote for the counter candidate, but it does mean that there is other elements in play in this equation, which the system is constantly trying to control, uh, but usually not managing to, at least not to the 100% that it always aims to. 
Thank you very much. Um, I want to now move to our second topic. We will be discussing this election's impact on Iran's domestic policies, and then also look at Iran's foreign affairs and engagements, um, especially with the West. But Azad, at first I want to ask you about the election's potential impact on Iran's domestic policies as uh, it was it was mentioned there is, we see this uh, sense of hopelessness in the population we also again as you mentioned see that some of the uh, political factions within the country mainly the reformists have had all of their candidates uh, disqualified basically being banned from running in the race they've also said uh, announced publicly that they don't have a candidate in this election and won't officially uh, participate as a political party we also know that the Islamic Republic is dealing with domestic crises, the uh, brutal repression of anti-government protests in November 2019 is still something that's very um, fresh in the mind of the Iranian population. The downing of the Ukrainian plane in January of 2020 is also something that um, I hear a lot of voters reference when they're talking about their a lack of trust or um, any form of uh, belief in the system. Talk about what you think uh, will be the impact of this election, whichever way it goes. It, we know the hardliners want it to go one way, but as Ruzba was saying, things can change even until the last day. And we see some uh, shifts and developments happening minor, but some happening this week. Talk about what you think the impact of this election will be on Iran's domestic political scene, the role of the civil society, women's issues and human rights and all of these grievances that have been building up within the population. Let me combine that with your previous question on voter apathy, because I think they are closely um, interlinked here. Um, I agree with what has been said that obviously the election process is dynamic and we could see surprises for sure. But it seems that in recent polls, at least there's some indication that we have about one third of the population determined to vote, one third of the population, or at least the electorate, not the population, I should say, determined not to vote, and one third which seems to be undecided. Now, obviously, this can go into different directions. A lot of things can happen here. But if we look at those who are or seem to be determined not to vote, they seem to be mostly what used to be the core base of the reformist current. Those people who went to the ballot boxes, not only due to economic woes, but who actually had hopes in terms of civil liberties, in terms of liberalization, political liberalization in society. And they were disappointed over and over again, not only in the Khatami area, era, but also now after eight years of Rouhani, who entered an alliance with, with reformists, who made some promises regarding liberalization, who made promises with regard to the house arrest of the leaders of the Green Movement, but who didn't really make much progress. So the question now for those who hope that Himati could be now a new, let's say, leading figure to lead people to the ballot boxes is, what actually enables him to succeed where everyone else before him actually failed? And we haven't really heard an answer to that from the reformers, from the moderate camps. So a lot of people who seem to have been determined to turn their back on the ballot boxes, who think that it simply doesn't make any sense anymore voting, who think that taking part in elections as a means for meaningful political change have lost their significance, I think to get those people to mobilize them is going to be incredibly difficult for someone like Himati. However, I think if we look at those who are undecided yet, and there seems to be quite the bulk of the electorate still thinking about voting, maybe on, in the, on the finishing lines, they might see Himati, and I think this is how he's trying to position himself, as let's say the last line of defense before hardliners have a con con complete takeover of the Islamic Republic. And if he can present himself as this la last line of defense, maybe that might mobilize some people, but I'm doubtful that you can actually get to those who have really, really um, given up on elections as a means for change. And to bring that back to your question, even if Himmati were to be elected, do we really expect civil society to, to flourish? Do we really expect women's rights to become a high priority on the agenda? I'm not saying that nothing can be achieved on the Himati presidency, but I'm trying to reflect some of the sentiment that we see from those voters who have been frustrated and angry and disillusioned by the kind of limited progress that they saw in the past. 
um, that just preventing something from getting worse is just not good enough anymore. And I'm afraid that this is probably going to prevent a lot of voters from even going for someone like Hemati. So I don't expect much to happen here on the civil society front, much to happen on the women's rights front. We have a lot of people who tried their best, women, uh, teachers, uh, laborers, labor right workers, human rights defenders, a lot of people who will still be active. But I think even on a Hemati presidency, under a Hemati presidency, it will be quite difficult for them due to the systemic obstacles that are still in place to see substantial progress anytime soon. Thank you, Azad. The, as you mentioned, Hemati or Abdul Nasser Hemati is a technocrat, literally a banker. He has a PhD in economics, uh, not much of a political figure with a lot of charisma. But Ruzba, I want to turn this to you and ask a sort of two combined questions. If you think what Azad was mentioning that Hemati, if he were to win, make some final moment uh, surprise and, um, and win basically having this economist a uh, technocrat, this person who's been really in the banking and financial system in the past two decades in the Islamic Republic, if he would have a chance uh, to make meaningful change um, as a president within the Islamic Republic. And then I also want to combine that with this question of what's the alternative? Because when I speak to voters in Iran underground, there's this sense of hopelessness and frustration as Azad was explaining, but then there's also another group who constantly asks the question of what is the alternative? If not you know, fighting or resisting within the system through these available channels, very limited but available, what is the alternative? And we also don't seem to hear much um, answer to that question. I want to pose both of these questions, Rizwa, to you and um, hear what you think would be the potential impact of a Hemeti win or also loss in the election on Iran's domestic policy. Well, I mean, I think, uh, I mean, th this is an existential question. I mean, this is about the fact that uh, this is a choice between pest and cholera. This is not something where you can choose to opt out and then you will not be facing the consequences not participating is an active choice. And you will suffer the consequences from that as much as you would if you did participate. So in a sense, as, an, as a voter in Iran, you have a Faustian pact with this system, which is that either you do not participate and their hardcore constituencies win. And we have had uh, experiences of, of that before in parliamentary elections where people have boycotted and, and the hardliners basically just sweep the whole place. Uh, or you participate where you thereby to some degree legitimize the system, but that gives you some leverage, not a lot of leverage, mostly damage control leverage, but that sometimes is, is all you can ask for or at least all you can hope for, and that is better than nothing. So I think my argument would be that rather than say that let's just give up this, because even giving up doesn't mean that you can opt out of Iran. I mean, you're still sitting there, so you're still going to be facing all the consequences of whoever controls the place. Uh, I would say it's then better to at least try and sway the little you can, this oil tanker as it kind of moves along in the ocean of, of whatever this is that they're navigating. As for whether Hemati wins and what it does mean, I mean, I agree with us that it's not going to suddenly be a 180 degree change, but I think that would be unrealistic to expect of anyone. Biden is not an 180 uh, degrees change from Trump either. There's always more continuity than people would want to stomach. But the thing is that what could happen is that you could have an easier engagement with the world outside, and that could help fuel some change in Iran. It's not going to be systemic because that's not something the system will allow, but it can allow for pockets of air, as it were, where people can breathe, whether that is in civic rights or whether it's economically, because I think that's one thing that Hemati is equally bad at as all the other candidates, which is to come up with an economic plan that is convincing for the millions of people in Iran who live in poverty. Basically, one of the big problems of the Islamic Republic is that most of their politicians subscribe to this ridiculous trickle-down idea, where they think if you can just get enough money into the system, somehow it's going to trickle down to everyone in society, and it doesn't. It never has. Uh, so these are things that they need to address. So I don't think he's going to be a game changer, uh, but I think if he were to be elected, engagement with the world outside would be easier, and that would alleviate some of the problems in Iran. 
Thank you, Ruzba. It's interesting. One of the slogans that Hemati has been using, which goes along with what you're saying to sort of damage control is saying that come and vote for me so I will not be the last president of the Islamic Republic, meaning that the Republic aspect of the system is, is diminish, diminishing by the hardliners. I want to now shift to Iran's foreign policy. As I want to start by you in uh, asking what you think the impact of this election will be on Iran's um, foreign policy as a whole. We know Iran has a very uh, strong and vivid presence in its region, it's present in multiple conflict zones in the Middle East. I also want you to take a look at Iran's engagements with the West. We know Iran and the United States and the P5 uh, plus one basically are engaging directly and indirectly in Vienna on the nuclear issue. What will this election mean? A potential hardline win um, for Iran's compliance with the nuclear deal, and this just in general Iran's outlook um, to the West and uh, towards Europe. I think first of all there is, I believe, some misperception or some fear that if a hardliner is elected, that would essentially mean the end of the nuclear agreement. And I don't think that is the case at all. Um, if you look at the candidates, most of them, almost all of them, do subscribe to the idea of a nuclear agreement being reinstated, have some different ideas about how to implement it and how to deal with talks with the outside world. But overall, they seem to be supporting the nuclear agreement as a whole. I believe that if we actually manage to find a political understanding under this government still in Iran, um, then there will be enough systemic support for something that is basically a done deal that will be incredibly difficult for a new, even a hardline president to come um, take over and then just throw out of the window altogether. Um, I think things would be a little bit more difficult if we didn't manage to find a political solution anytime soon, because there is a danger of some of the debates shifting, uh, particularly on the nuclear front. But overall, I'm quite confident that and quite positive that if we find a solution, a political understanding in the upcoming weeks, um, then this will probably hold. Where I do see them, some differences, however, is that whoever becomes president, regardless of it being Hemati or Raisi or Rezaia, somebody else, will be less invested in the nuclear agreement than Rouhani was. For Rouhani, the nuclear agreement was basically the foundation of his political program. It was a strong cornerstone. So a new president would definitely be less invested politically, and this might have some effect on implementing the deal. It might have some effect on the cooperative nature of, let's say, um, talking about dissent when it comes to implementation. And as we all know, there are other areas on the nuclear file beyond the JCPOA that are still outstanding, outstanding issues with the IAEA um, regarding certain activities in Iran's past that are still to be clarified. And here we might, um, I think, see some obstacles here and there when it comes to cooperation under a hardline president. Overall, I think um, having, let's say, a hardline president here, somebody like Raisi, where we have all branches of power being in the hand of one political camp, might actually yield some positive results as well. It makes it easier for them to engage with the West. There's probably less opposition than there was before. It would be much more difficult for Hemati, let's say, on the regional front or ballistic missile front to even enter any kind of follow-up talks with the United States or the Europeans which is something that they're aspiring, might be easier actually for a hardline president. So there are areas where I think some things will get easier, other areas where things will be more difficult. As Ruzbe said, I think engaging on a political level would certainly be more easy, easier for the Europeans, certainly with Hemati than it would be with Raisi and his background in the judiciary and his role in the mass executions. Um, at the end of the 80s. So there's a lot of ups and downs here. Overall, I believe whoever gets elected, Europeans, the United States, they need to deal with it. They need to uphold the kind of agreements that they're trying to enter now and try their best to make some progress on the regional front as well, regardless of whether there's a moderate or hardline president in place. Ruzbe, I want to also pose this to you. As, as I mentioned, Ibrahim Raisi, the hardline candidate, has a controversial past. He's already designated uh, by the United States, is a sanctioned person by the United States, and it will be, it will be difficult for a diplomatic path 
um, with the West once he becomes president. I want to ask you what you think his potential presidency will impact Iran's uh, foreign policy, both across the region and also with the West. And then talk about the issues beyond a nuclear deal. We know President Biden has mentioned that he wants to potentially talk to Iran, negotiate on issues beyond a nuclear program on Iran's missiles program, on Iran's regional presence, and even domestic policy and human rights. Talk about how you think all of those will play out with the potential uh, Raisi presidency or the opposite, a last minute Hemati surprise. Well, I mean, I think uh, if Raisi gets elected, it's going to be difficult for the Europeans to interact with him on a personal level uh, because of the things that you have already mentioned. But I think that was the case during Ahmadinejad as well. So I think it's going to be very crucial then for his own administration, if they want to have an effective foreign policy, to make sure that they have a foreign minister who can come and go un un uh, unhindered, so to speak, by any kinds of files of that kind. So I mean, that, that would be very crucial for him to have someone who can speak for him very professionally to the outside world and the Europeans in particular. I think one of the conceptual uh, problems on this side, that is say the Europeans and the Americans in particular, is of course that once the JCPOA is set and everyone goes back to compliance, then we have a long laundry list of things we want Iran to change. And somehow they're going to comply to that because they're so grateful that, that we are still in the JCPOA. And I think that's, that's absolutely wrong. I mean, I think that's a, that's a huge uh, misconception of how politics work. And I also think it, it's a huge misconception of how policy is made in Tehran. I mean, the thing here is that on these things, to a much larger degree than people are willing to account for, there is continuity, because this is a systemic decision. This is not a decision made by one single president. That means that there is much more continuity on these issues, one. And two, some of these portfolios are not in the hand of the president. Uh, and three, on some of these issues, Iran is not going to negotiate as in giving up. Often when people talk about negotiations here in the West, it's about how Iran is going to give up this or that, Syria, Iraq, missiles, whatnot. I don't think that's how it's going to fly. I don't think there is much difference between the different factions when it comes to strategic threat perception. And the missiles, for instance, are a crucial element of Iranian defense. So that's not something that they're going to negotiate away, irrespective of who is the president. Now, they can be uh, variously flexible, and they can be more or less pedagogical in trying to present their case to the outside world. And there, obviously, the hardliners have a lot to learn if they want to be taken seriously. Uh, but I think the bottom line is more or less going to be the same, regardless of who is the president. It's going to be more a question of nuance, atmosphere, which is not irrelevant, because that's where some of these more difficult things are actually solved. Uh, so there it could be that Raisi, while he has a much easier way of shoring up the system around himself and his own position, because of, as Azad mentioned, uh, might have greater difficulty in selling that outside of the country which you know, inevitably is something you also have to be able to do if you want to have an effective foreign policy. Well, I could talk to you both for hours about this topic, but that's about it as far as our time. Um, I was joined, I want to thank you again, Azadeh Zamirira, the Deputy Head of the Africa and Middle East Division at the German Institute for International and Security Affairs in Berlin, and Ruzbeh Parsi, Head of the Middle East and North Africa Program at the Swedish Institute of International Affairs. Thank you for joining this um, session of the series of Iran in Focus by Friends of Europe and hope you can join the rest of our events as well. Thank you.